in my doc program, I was reading a lot of literature on dyslexia. But I just became fascinated about dyslexia because I lived that. I became fascinated about the research. And I was like, wait, this is me. I've lived all this stuff. So then I was like, you know what? I need to read stuff on black boys with dyslexia. So I was doing all these literature reviews and I was finding zero, nothing. I'm like, what? How is this possible? All the sample sizes were all majority white kids. I'm like, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. So then I started noticing that there was a trend that we were identified as at risk, behavioral, all these other adjectives that describe us descriptively, right? Like we're not even present, right? We're just some lost cause in the back of the classroom and being defiant. So I was like, I got to flip the script here. Hello, and welcome to the Black and Dyslexic Podcast with Winifred A. Winston and LaDerek Horn, the show that unapologetically focuses on helping Black and underrepresented minorities navigate the special education process. We want to help raise awareness in the Black and Brown community, remove the stigma about learning disabilities, and provide you access to professionals in the space of dyslexia and special education that you need to hear from. Today, we have Dr. Sean Anthony Robinson with us. I'm so excited. He is an author, educator, college professor, let me be clear, college professor, and motivational speaker. And this is going to be fun, you guys, because again, I know Sean. and We know Sean. Yes, we know Sean. <laughs> and so th this is going to be a fun one. So Sean, tell the people a little bit about yourself in your own words. I thank you, Lederick, for, for having me on your uh, podcast. I have to say it, it's genius. It's brilliant. It's an excellent way to reach audiences and communities that may or may not have access to knowledge, right? Particularly within the context of uh, these learning spaces. Uh, so first of all, I just want to say thank you for the work you're doing. It's work that needs to be done. It's authentic. It's real. It's not like some of these other podcasts out here, but it's a different story. But I just really appreciate <laughs> the work you're doing. It's, it's, uh, it's powerful work. So I want to make that clear that, you know, I just thank God that, you know, you are um, delivering this message. And so... Uh, for me, I have dyslexia. I've had it my whole life. I have it my, my whole life. It's not like I just wake up tomorrow and be like, hey, I'm cured, right? Uh, <laughs> so I was in special education, my entire K-12 journey, self-contained classes. Not much learning really occurred. I spent two years at an uh, alternative high school where they send the misunderstood kids, not bad kids, misunderstood. And I had some great teachers at that school, too, who I loved to, to death, who are a part of my family that really helped me understand how to love myself. I think that's the first thing, the battle we have to overcome is how do we really love ourselves as, as students, particularly when we can't read. And so, uh, you know, traveling that space of the unknown, particularly within the context of special education, not knowing how to read, uh, took a toll on me psychologically, right? Now, if you can't read, like you just like a, a soulless person with no spirit, you just feel like you're, you're less than, you don't feel like you really will amount to anything. And so uh, that's how I felt. I just felt like I, I was incompetent. You know, people called me stupid. I felt stupid. I spoke into existence, right? Your tongue has power, language has power. And it wasn't until my mother found a, uh, a professor who taught me how to, how to read after I graduated high school, reading at an elementary level. Uh, he literally taught me how to crack the code. Uh, and then from that point on, I, I uh, became a sponge and I observed as much uh, book knowledge as I could because I became uh, a consumer of education and I became um, someone who loved school. I loved to learn. Uh, I loved just reading, spelling, you know, just being able to grasp knowledge from books because he, un he unlocked something for, for me, like a gift. He unlocked that gift for me to appreciate our structure of language, appreciate just learning. And Sean, I just want to be clear about this. That, that, Cracking the code didn't happen until after you graduated from high school, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, All right. Yeah. Go ahead. I don't, I don't, I don't want to oh, cut yeah. you off, but I just, I wanted to make sure because that, I mean, this is something that we hope will will happen for all of us earlier on in life. But I know you and I have very similar stories. I didn't really start getting in that same space until until I was much older. But please go ahead. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So you know, uh, it was after high school and. Um, I was literally an uh, 18 year old and I started his program two weeks after I, I graduated high school. You know, I was, I was immature. I was one of the most, uh, they call it at that time, you know, disabled, illiterate kids out in a cohort of 55 students. You know, again, you know, here I am, 18, starting college, reading at an elementary level. Ain't much more, you know, that one can go through and to think about how to change 
the trajectory of the life and narrative if you can't you can't read, particularly at as an adult, right? Like 18, you're you know, you're not an adult, but you really are moving into the adulthood of your life, your stage, your next chapter. And so um you literally just taught me how to crack the code, you know, using old school Orton Gillingham approach that was systematic, sequential, direct, explicit. So I studied underneath him, you know, for 18 years after high school. Got my undergrad, took me six years. Got my uh, master's, took me five years. Got my PhD, took me seven years. So I was in school 18 straight years uh, after high school, you know, um, hustling. Uh, I tell students, I'm tired. I'm, I'm, I don't want to ever go to school ever again, uh, <laughs> ever. Like, I'm a big advocate for, for school, but I'm done. I'm tired. I, I, I have nothing to prove anymore. Like, I... 18 years was a, a long journey. I had a lot of ups and downs. Undergrad, I had professors that told me I wouldn't be anything. It failed me, told me to do something different. Master's program, I had, you know, encountered some, but I had some great professors there. And then my PhD program, which was mainly whole language, um, it was pretty anti-dyslexia. And so I ran to two professors that failed me and told me I should do something different. Uh, Dr. Strop and Dr. Uh, Sue Terry, yeah, I put their name out there. I don't even care. They failed me. They told me I wasn't being nothing. You know, basically just told me to do something different. And I took their class again and I passed. So, you know, uh, I'm very fortunate for the people that provided me this space to get where I'm at today. You know, I wouldn't be who I am uh, today without Dr. Robert T. Nash. And I always speak his name into existence, even though he passed away in uh, 2017. Uh, none, none of my uh, success in the academy. None of the accolades, doesn't really matter. Anything, publications, this podcast, anything I've done to this point in my life has been because of one person that um, saw my, my gift and my potential and unlocked it for me and allowed me to uh, be liberated in the sense of things like Malcolm X, right? He learned to read in, in, in prison, right? That dictionary. That's pretty much what Dr. Nash told me how to do. He told me how to crack the code using the dictionary. And the dictionary changed my life forever. It really gave me appreciation of our language, the structure of our language, you know, graphemes, phonemes, taught me how to just appreciate words, you know, and prefix, suffixes, root words, pronunciation, stresses, all that stuff. So he really just, you know, again, uh, I, I give I give favor and glory to God because without Dr. Nash, I wouldn't be here. Like none of my successes at all, nothing, without this one man who really unlocked the door for me to get in. And um, all, all my experiences, too, have been a result of failure. I tell students all the time, like, you know, my failure is what has what has driven me to be successful. I wasn't successful just overnight, right? It's taken me years of practice, patience, and persistence, like the little train, choo-choo. I just, I just had to keep moving. Like, I just, you know, like Muhammad Ali, still on the ropes, bob and weave, you know? I had to just put my head down, stay focused, and uh, not get distracted by, uh, you know, the demonic spirits out there in the airwaves, you know, because we know they're out there, you know, black, white, doesn't matter. You know, it, there's people out there that don't really want students to be successful, particularly within the context of special education. I don't need to go into the research. I don't need to talk about that. We know it. It's, it's obvious. Look at the data every year, you know, of black and brown students reading. I mean, it's been historically ingrained in our system since slavery. It's nothing new. I'm not trying to, you know, start a race debate. You know, it's just, it is what it is. Uh, so. And I Again. think, Sean, I think you are moving in the direction to be that light, to be that hope for children. You know, I first came across you with um, your article that you wrote, Educating Black Males with Dyslexia, right? And you you talk about it. And I was so drawn to it because I'm like, oh, my gosh, here's someone talking about the experience of a black boy, right? And, and yeah. you got a lot of pushback. And we would just encourage each other online. It was basically like, nah, keep, stay focused, forget them. Like, this is real. It's different for us. And then you have um, your first book, Dr. Dyslexia Dude. Yes. And when I tell you, I bought a stack and I started the Decoded Dyslexia Baltimore City chapter support group here in Maryland. And yes. so when parents would come, because, you know, there's that thing about black parents not showing up or, or you know, we're not present. When folks would come, I give them a book. You, I tell you. you won the first three people to get here, get a book. Yes. <laughs> and I was giving out the book and I was posting it everywhere. And I remember um, my daughter was at a private dyslexia school and we had the book. Now, I didn't really know what I was doing. It wasn't really intentional. I just had the book and it was a nice scene to like take a picture. But I remember taking a picture of my daughter holding up that book in front of the sign of the private school. 
right? I remember that. Yeah, I remember that picture. Yep. Yeah. She was holding the book. Yep. Yes, yeah. yes. But I got so many DMs, right? And so many um, parents. What school is that? That didn't know. Oh, it's a private dyslexia school. Can you tell me more about it? Right. And it was something about that book and that school. And then I redid the post and said, not every person can afford a private dyslexia. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, I remember that post. Right. Yep. I'm like, yep. not every person can afford this. What can we do to change it? Right. So once Dr. Nash cracked the code for you, you've been on a mission to be that light that beacon of hope for somebody else. Cause we were talking about it before we started recording, but you still wear the, the superhero suit, right? <laughs> Dr. Dyslexia dude. Yeah, can, can you can you tell us a little bit about the the birth of uh, the alter ego and the and the book, Dr. Dyslexia dude? Uh, I think it's when it first said too, you know, when I was in my, in my doc program, you know, God had clearly, clearly give me a vision, you know, uh, particularly since Dr. Nash taught me how to read, like you really uh, inspired me to appreciate learning. And so in my doc program, I was reading a lot of literature on dyslexia because I just became fascinated about dyslexia because I lived that, I became fascinated about the research. And I was like, wait, this, this is me. Like I've lived all this stuff. So then I was like, you know what? I need to read stuff on black boys with dyslexia. So I was doing all these literature reviews and I was finding zero, nothing. I'm like, what? Like, how is this possible? You know, all the sample sizes were all majority white kids. I'm like, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. I was like, wait, wait, no. So then I started noticing that there was a trend that, you know, we were identified as at risk, you know, behavioral, you know, all these other um, adjectives, you know, that describe us descriptively, right? Like, we're, we're not even present, right? We're just some lost cause in the back of the classroom and the, being defiant. So I was like, I got to flip the script here. So then I started just um, trying to find ways to intersect the two, uh, you know, black and dyslexia. And then I started seeing uh, themes, trends come out and I started noticing that there was trends about giftedness, right? And I'm like, wait. So then I started consulting with um, some uh, experts in the gifted field, uh, particularly one, uh, Dr. Donald Ford, who, who's now at the University of Ohio, the Ohio State, I make sure I can say that correctly because I don't get beat up, you know, if I don't say the Ohio State correctly. Uh, and she really helped me understand that space of giftedness. So then it all kind of emerged. And then so after my, my uh, doc program, I just asked my wife, I said, hey, you know, we got to reach an audience that's not being reached, right? I mean, let's be honest. Are you two reading a lot of scholarly articles and peer review journals and book chapters? N no. not, not that many, no, sir. You think parents that listen to this podcast are doing the same thing? All right. I mean, we can't generalize it, but I mean, we, we, we know that majority of parents are not going to read those things. Those are only for, you know, the, the academy, right? And to please egos, right? It's just, it is what it is. I'm not saying anything that's, you know, not known. And so um, I told my that we got to flip the script. We got to make this accessible. We got to try to figure out how we can get the message out to, to kids uh, within the context of uh, race and, and uh, dyslexia and giftedness. And so uh, my wife and I took a chance and we took my work, my lived experiences, and which cannot be generalized to anybody else. We all have our different experiences. Um, and that's what we did. And, um, you know, I got to give credit to my wife. You know, my first attempt at trying to write uh, it was poor. And my wife was like, Sean, I don't want to read this garbage. She was like, <laughs> she was like no one's going to read this. She's like, this is too te technical. This is too, you know, academic. She's like, no kid's going to read that. I mean, because that's how I, my mind was framed. Right? It was all the academy, academic space, you know, language and, you know, high vocabulary words and trying to sound pompous. And she's like, no, 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 we got to come down to, to earth on reality. And so we put it out there and, you know, grace of God, it, it took off. And we just really wanted to be able to um, allow kids, not just kids with dyslexia, but kids who, who may not have dyslexia to understand you know, what a student with dyslexia goes through to try to educate them. But to be unapologetic about it, we wanted to make sure that Blacks, boys were seen within the context of race, dyslexia, and giftedness. We, want, we were intentional about that because we wanted our kids to be able to see themselves in the book in a positive light. We wanted to make sure that they know that there is a way out, 
we want to make sure that they know that there's somebody that's walking a similar path that they're on. And the path does not have to be as hard. And the path doesn't have to be, uh, you know, psychologically damaging to, for them. So we want to just flip the, flip the script and help students change their mindset, shift it from a deficit to, you know, what I can, what I will do. Uh, and so that's where that, you know, kind of superhero theme emerged is, you know, we all have our own powers inside, right? Like I said, like Derek, you're a poet, right? You speak, that's, a, that's a power itself, right? That's spoken language, right? Winifred, you have many talents, so I'm not gonna even go there, you know? So, but we all are born with some sort of talent and gift, right? But sometimes it takes somebody to unlock that talent for us. And so we just want to use that book as a way to reach kids and to, to give them hope. You know, again, I got, I got, we got pushback from a lot of researchers say, oh, you can't use the word dyslexia or this book is not uh, empirically based. Man, take that stuff somewhere else. I'm not <laughs> trying to write it for you. I'm trying to write it for kids. Like this is for kids, not egos, kids. Like we want to make sure this book gets in the kids' hands for three reasons. One, self-empowerment, right? You see people like you in books, it empowers you, right? It's equity. It levels the playing field, right? So that's why we did it. It's not about serving egos, but serving kids to make sure kids had access to books, first of all, and then books that just allow them to be engaged. And I tell you, the emails that my wife and I will see from, from teachers, parents like, you know, Winifred and others about the book and the impact it had on their child and how it changed their child's perspective about themselves. That's it right there, man. I think it was the first book of color that we came across when my daughter was identified. It was the first book with a, a, a black character that talked about dyslexia. It, it, matter of fact, it was the first, it was because the other books had little white kids on it. Right. And I just kept thinking, like, I need my daughter's at a white school now. I need something to represent her where she can see herself, you know, with this learning disability, because we were going through some things just being, I want to say, thrown in into this space and not really understanding how it lacked diversity. Right. And, and we know that it's the number one learning disability and what research says one in five. But I just didn't see a lot of people that look like us. So when I saw your book, I'm like, oh, my gosh. And who wrote this? And like I said, I ordered tons of it, because at that time, I think if you ordered so many or if you ordered them, there was money going back to help parents. Yeah, yeah, we're, still, yeah, we're so we have like 3000, this only 3000 books left to try to get out. And once we sell those 3000, uh, 20 percent of the you know, we made off of selling 10,000 is going back into the International Dyslexia Association to start a scholarship for, for families. Um, so, you know, again, I don't try to solicit my book to people. I don't like say, hey, let Derek buy this book, you know, or Winifred. I'm not, that's not who I am. You know, whatever the Holy Spirit moves me to buy the book, they buy the book. You know, it's $5. And, you know, Starbucks coffee costs more, right? So that's why we made the, the book accessible and affordable for families. And so, uh, like you said, Winifred, once we can get these next 3,000 books out, my wife and I are cutting a check to IDA, and we're making sure that their scholarships that it started, it starts to help families. You know, well, I'm going to uh, shout out the book, and I'm going to put it in the show notes, and I'm going to tell people to buy the book, because now, not only do you have Dr. Dyslexia do, but you're on um, book number three, Cracking the Code with Additional Characters. Yes. So right. I'm, I'm going to put it out there. We're going to put it out there. You, you don't have to, but I'm going to tell right. people to buy the book. It's $5. Right. And once he reaches the goal, money goes back to help families because we know getting remediation and intervention in this space is expensive. Yeah. Okay. It's expensive for tutoring. It's expensive for advocacy, right? And if you want to go to a private dyslexia school, that's expensive. Even if you try to go and earmarks the free route, right? Because that means an attorney is involved. You know, the whole gamut of services is expensive, right? And even if you're in public school, the expense is that your child is being left behind while you you are fighting and fighting and fighting. So we're going to put it out there just so you know. Uh, well, thank you. Um, I appreciate that. You know, I'm just, like I said, this is all God's service, you know, like I'm just trying to do good in this, wor this world. And, you know, like book two, it's pretty much a dollar more. So it's six bucks, right? And then book three is, uh, I think, $9.20 with tax. It comes out to 10 bucks even. I mean, so again, we're not trying to make a book 20 bucks because we know a lot of families can't afford that, right? So our, our audience is not 
those, you know, that may have a lot of capital. Our, our audience are those that don't have the access to get into a lot of these environments, right? And one thing that we think about the word remediation, and there's nothing wrong with what you said, but I, I want people out there to think about this, right? When they say remediation, it talks about like a student like is might not be capable of doing something, right? It's almost has a negative, uh, you know, descriptive to it, right? So when we train teachers, how come we don't say that teachers are being remediated too in the science of reading? It's the same thing. It's the same concept. It's the same philosophy. So don't tell me that you're remediating my child. Tell me that you're giving my son or my daughter or my students a high level course on word structure, word analysis. That's why at the college I teach at for adult learners, it's word analysis because it's critical thinking. It's high level instruction. I'm not going to call it remedial, you know, 99 or 98. Man, come on. That psychology takes the students out the game already. Like, you know, oh, I'm taking this remedial class. Oh, my God. You know, so if teachers are getting trained in the science of reading, well, to me, they're getting remediated. I mean, it, <laughs> right. It, 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 it is what it is. You know, <laughs> language has power. So don't tell me you're going to remediate a young black and brown kid or adult but you're going to offer a high uh, intensive, explicit, direct instruction workshop for teachers. No, no, no. Flip the script. You're doing the same thing for a kid you're doing for a teacher. Yeah. That's my opinion. Again, there's no right or wrong answer, but that's how I, that's how I frame it with my students that I, I teach. It's like, look, no, no, no. You are capable of learning the same stuff that teachers learn, and we're not going to call it remedial. We're calling it word analysis because we do analyze words. That's what you're doing in science of reading or in Gillingham. Barton system, Wilson, you're analyzing words, you're analyzing the sound structure. Uh, and that's what we do. We analyze I, things. I try to use those words, remediation, intervention, because I know that the schools are using those words and the parents need to understand what it means in the context of getting your child help, right? Because a lot of times we see IEPs where they're just giving them accommodations. Yeah. When my daughter started out, they kept saying they're going to give her more time, right? And I didn't know the language... I didn't know, I call it teacher talk, but I kept saying, okay, more time, she doesn't know how to read. Whenever she sounds out the words, she's saying the front end, the back end, but she can't mash. This is what I said. She can't mash it together. Like this is how I was explaining it in the IEP meeting. I'm like, she says the front part and she sounds that out and she sounds out the end, but she can't mash it together, right? And what I didn't understand was when the IEP is written, the services is different than the accommodation. The yep. services is where the remediation, the intervention, the specialized instruction comes in. But I didn't really get that. But I knew calling, letting her know that you're going to call her on the carpet first wasn't teaching her how to read. But I didn't understand the language, right? And, and yep. I didn't understand what it meant in terms of what they should be doing. They would use those words, but then I didn't understand what you should be doing is providing, you know, specialized instruction, to yep, teach yep. her how to read, yep. not give her more time because she yep. just may always be a slow reader and need more time. Yep. And so I try to use those words that I know that the school is going to use, but then mm-hmm. break it down so parents understand what they're supposed to be getting. Yep. But see, yeah. even even within that context though, right? It's, again, there's no right or wrong answer because Winifred knows everything. I'm just, you know, a little, a piano <laughs> trying to be like her, you know, when I grow up, right? Stop it! <laughs> so, 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 so we think like think, so we think about this, right? How are school systems using that word remediation though, right? How are they framing that when it comes to students with dyslexia, but also students that look like us, right? Is remediation a low standard or is it a high standard, right? I believe that when they use it, it it's a low standard. And that's why when I say think about the context of how the word's being used, right? So parents need to think about that, like, okay. Are they giving my son or daughter a lower level education when it comes to reading? Or are they giving, giving them an AP experience when it comes to reading remediation, right? And so that's why I guess I'm saying in that context is we have to help parents understand deeper what that word really means and how it's being used within the context of special education and reading instruction. I'm not disagreeing with you, right? Because you know everything. You, you, you're the great all be all, <laughs> Winif- Winifred herself. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, we have to think about the words because words have power, right? They, no, they, you're they, right. They, yeah, you know? and, I, and, I, and I love that, particularly for the school leaders, 
right? Uh, district building level who are listening to this, right? Like thinking about how they use language in describing these classes and these educational spaces and the effect that has on our, our yeah. students, right? Yeah. And, and I think it's one of the things that has come up throughout the course of the, the podcast, just how powerful that language is and how those little shifts can make a huge difference in someone's self-concept and then for the professionals, the sort of energy that they bring when they're coming to do the work. Yeah, it's a language is, you know, as we know, even in the biblical terms, language, it can make or break us, right? It can kill people, right? The tongue has power to it. And so, you know, if you keep saying these words from a negative, you know, uh, context and perspective, well, what do you expect a kid to do? They're going to start living that. They're going to start speaking it. They're going to start walking around the school like that, right? right? They're going to start thinking less than about themselves. So we have to learn how to flip the script. It's all the mind game. It really is a, all comes down to the mind, right? And Because once your mind goes, what goes afterwards? Your body, body. your spirit, your soul, right? Mm -hmm. And so language has power. In, and if we keep designing these, these programs with low expectations, well, damn. You know, you, you, what you put in is what you're going to get, right? And so if you want low expectations, you're going to get low expectations. If you want high expectations, you're going to get high expectations. So um, that's why I just said, for me, when I hear remediation, I don't, I don't get an argument. I just try to, you know, have a civil conversation about the word and how it's being used within that context. Because again, a lot of people think, you know, that it's framed just for slow students. Oh, I'm going to remediate little Johnny or remediate little Derek or remediate little Sean. No, I don't need remediation. I need some AP, some knowledge that's going to get me to be accelerated, right? Get me to move forward, to get me to learn to crack the code, right? So that's all I'm trying to say. You no, know? That, again, that's a great, that's a great point. And the way you explained it, I think parents will appreciate that because parents, you know, we have a lot of parents who are afraid of the assessment. And then you throw in words like remediation and they're automatically thinking, oh, you think my child is slow, right? So, so you, you explain that and articulate that very well. So now when parents hear that word, they'll understand it even more and parents will appreciate what you just described and they'll, and they'll be able to better advocate for their, for their kiddos. So tell us how you're continuing to do this work. Cause I know you just did a TEDx. So I want to hear about that. And I know you just did a keynote. Like you're the man. You're trying to big me up. But nah, no, 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 no. Derek's the man. I'm just a little peon. I'm just trying to be like you. I'm in your shadows. Coach, coach, <laughs> coach, put me in. Coach. Hey, coach, I'm like the six, I'm like the bench player. Coach, I just want to get in the game. Coach, I just want to be in the game. You know, before and before you respond to, to what's going what you got going on, what you're doing in the future, I just want to say to the audience that you can tell that we are friends all of us. And so this little ribbing is, is done from a place of love. And I also just want to point out how nurturing this circle of friendship, um, you know, the, some of the, the people who have been on the podcast and will be on the podcast are part of a sort of extended circle of support, you know, over the past couple of years through the pandemic, through, you know, George Floyd's murder and, and the cry for Black Lives Matter that went out across our country. I think we've all gotten a lot closer and it's been like, I just appreciate the energy and the the joy. We're recording this on a Sunday, Sunday morning. And I, I you know, I feel like, a, uh, you know, I'm here with the Reverend Dr. Sean <laughs> Robinson. <All> right. <laughs> uh, make sure you give a tie, though, man. Give a tie. Okay. <laughs> give a tie this morning. Pass the bucket, you know. But, you know, I want to just add to what Lederick is saying about the small community and the network. It wasn't always that way. No. Right. And it was a lot of black folks in this space working in silo. And we're all working towards the same goal to reach more black and brown families, to educate more black and brown families, to provide access to appropriate information and resources for black and brown families. And we found ourselves working in silo. Right. And, and with the, the events of Black Lives Matter and George Floyd, a lot of us, myself included, I shifted and I said, you know what? I got to be very intentional about reaching people that look like me and be unapologetic for it. Um, I found myself in white spaces a lot and always trying to be neutral. Oh, I want to help everybody. No, I want to help everybody, but I need to reach people who look like me because when we look at the school to prison pipeline and I thought, let me reach out to more providers, more advocates in this space who look like me so that we can come together and have a, a, a bigger impact. 
right? So I met Lederick at um, at IVA. I was immediately drawn to him because he was black, right? I was immediately like, he gonna be my friend. And, and <laughs> when I hit him up the first time, y'all, Davis, he was like, see my agent. I was like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> we're not gonna be friends, but I'm gonna keep trying, right? And and Sean and I, I just kept encouraging him because what he was doing, and he was so intentional. And at, at that point, I wasn't. And I just admired the, his strength and his courage and being so intentional about black boys and dyslexia, right? And I remember just encouraging him in the DM, like, no, don't give up. And it was a part of me saying, well, why aren't you doing that too? You know what I'm saying? And so that shift with everything that happened in the world just was like a wake up call for me. Like, nah, I started doing the black and dyslexic hashtag and it gave me permission to say, you know what? It's okay to focus on people that look like you and it's okay and it you know be unapologetic about it. So that's how we all really just came together and was like, no, we're gonna do this and we're gonna reach out people. That was so inspiring, Winifred. I'm gonna cry. Don't cry. The, no tears. <laughs> you know, my, my feelings are hurt, Winifred. You said earlier that I had articulated that so well. What you think? I can't speak? No. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm messing with you. I'm messing with you. <laughs> You explained it so. No, I know. I'm, 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 just, I'm just giving you a hard time, Winifred. I love, I love. But what I you. didn't know is, be honest, I didn't know you were so academic-y, right? I didn't really know that. that what you trying you, to say? No, because it is a different huh? language. It is. Right. It, it is a different language when you're speaking in academics. I call it teacher talk. Yeah, I yeah. never knew that because you never talk like that to us, right? Mm -hmm. So that to me was like wow he's playing both and he do it very well like when your wife said nobody was gonna read that book I sure wouldn't have read it because I don't like having to look up words and I don't like having to have it um tell me what it say like pronounce it and all that good stuff and yeah. I just want it in a very I don't know layman's term so I can understand it and that whole special education process is not designed that way right that IEP is a legally uh, legally binding document right yeah. and schools have attorneys Right. And so it's very hard for parents to understand what's going on. No, that's what I meant. Like, I know I'm just giving you a hard time. Don't give me a hard time. I'm going to edit it out. <laughs> no, 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 you're not. No, 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 no. It's authentic. It's real. It's, it's, your, it's your it's your truth. Right. Just like at three o'clock today, we're going to be at the bike rack for a little one on one. Like they do with little kids, you know, they'll duke it out three o'clock when the bell rings. You, you and me on, on, on the playground. <laughs> That's all so, good. So, Sean, can you, uh, uh, Winifred had set it up, but can can we go back to, can you just say a little bit about your your TEDx talk that you did recently and, and some of the other things you have going on? No, man, I'm done now. I've done, <laughs> I've done, my, I've done, I've done my 30 minutes of time. I thought you all, that's all you uh, people get. See, I said, you all people, you all people. No, it's all good. Uh, yeah, so I, I gave a, a, my first TEDx talk, you know, I was just blessed to, to be able to do that. Um, just spoke about my my lived experiences, you know, and talked about uh, Dr. Slex dude, and you know, it, it was a blessing because um, I had um, a couple years ago I had auditioned, interviewed for TEDx for a local organization here, a different one, and uh, I'm just gonna put out here the white people that interviewed me, they wanted me to change my narrative and and they wanted me to to speak what they wanted me to speak, and I was like, make it out of here, I'm not I'm not speaking, you know, what you want me to say, I'm speaking my truth. And if you can't handle it, then I'm not the right person there for you. Like it just, it is, it is what it is. Can you give us a glimpse as to what was wanted versus, uh, you know, what people got from your actual TEDx? What were they encouraging they want, you to talk about? Not talk about my experiences within the context of uh, special education as a black boy. They want me to frame it like, you know, I was in Disneyland or Wonderland or something like that. You know, I'm like, no, I ain't doing that. That's not how, that's not how I, uh, my journey. And so I'm not going to speak to, you know, what, you might fear, right? Or your own insecurities. No, I'm gonna speak my truth. I'm gonna speak from my heart and my heart is gonna be able to heal somebody else. I'm not gonna put on a, a different mask just to, no, I don't do that. I don't, I don't sell my soul to the devil, I'm good. I'll keep it moving, you know? So I had opportunity to do this TEDx talk and you know, it was a healing experience, experience for me, right? And I actually had an older white lady come up to me afterwards and she was like, that was a powerful story you said to me. And she was like, not to me, but the audience. And she's like, you're too humbled. She's like, you're way too humble. Hey, I'm a humble person. I don't go out there and, and try to brag to people. Oh, I got a PhD, you know, oh, I'm an author, you know, nah, I mean, I'm just a husband, father, and I like the bike. That's it, you know? And so she's like, well, you need to really, you know, 
be more open about all your successes. Now, you know, that's just not who my, my mom raised me to be. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful and blessed because, you know, at the end of the day, I can lose it just as fast as I got it, right? It could be gone like that if, I, if I'm not uh, grateful for what I've, what I've received in my life and how I received it, you know, and nothing I, I've earned was given to me. I put in 43 years on this earth, you know, of blood, sweat, and tears, you know, and discipline to get to where I'm at today. So I'm always, again, thankful for my experiences and thankful for, you know, the people in my past that have allowed me to get to where I'm at today. And so even with the TED Talk, you know, I was able to really highlight that, you know, um, I always talk about Dr. Nash, you know, and everyone, everyone says that, you know, how did you work with this white guy? You know, dude, he was a he was a man of God that taught me how to read. That's mm-hmm. it. He was on a journey to serve. That's it. He didn't see color. All he saw was somebody who couldn't read and he wanted to teach me how to read. And so, uh, again, you know, I'm, I'm very uh, transparent uh, about that. And just the TEDx talk experience was something beautiful. You know, my sons, my wife came and my sons always asked me, dad, when are you going to do another TEDx talk? So to me, that's more impactful that, you know, my sons get to see me do that, you know, and uh, the impact it has, not just them, but, you know, whoever was in the audience, maybe it, it touched one person, you know, as my pastor said, don't worry about the message, you know, don't worry about who listens to it, right, or who receives it, you can't control that, all you control is what you put out there in the airwaves, that is a positive message of hope, and then whoever grabs it, grabs it, right, like, so I was just very fortunate about for that, and then, you know, the work I do now at the community college, again, before my professor, Dr. Robert T. Nash, uh, you know, before he passed away, he signed over the rights to his work to me. You know, wow. and told, and told wow. I was going to ask about that. I wow. was like, I don't know if you yeah. wanted to go there, but I was definitely going to say, aren't you going to continue his work? Yeah, yeah, I'm doing this. I'm continuing his work now at the community college, teaching adult learners the same principles that he, he, he taught me. But, you know, I've taken it to a different level based on the work that I've done over the course of my uh, academic journey. And I have kind of strengthened it, but, you know, uh, one of the things that before Doc passed away, a lot of people were calling his wife asking who was going to take over his work because they saw money versus service, right? And so Doc started this program in 1979 with five students, right? When he had a vision, he was a visionary, like he had dyslexia himself, he was a visionary, like you two are, like he, he wanted to make change, systematic change. And so of all the students that he had taught to read, train throughout his career, he was like, I, I want to give the work to you, man. I'm like, me? I was like, oh, dang. I was like, I'm not ready for that. Like, I'm not ready. And I, I wasn't ready. And uh, and I kind of selfishly held it in me for, you know, from 2017 until now, where I just kind of just kept it to myself or did little things at a time. Because every time I did try to um, articulate, let me use that word, I wouldn't have heard, articulate <laughs> the 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 severity of dyslexia and the impact of his um, intervention and the system he designed, I always got pushback from people who didn't look like me. Always got pushback, you know, always, you know, need either their approval, permission, uh, you know, approval stamp. And then I think I had my breakthrough when I was in Iowa because the morning of, I wasn't going to talk about this work. I wasn't going to talk about just my experience. One of my fraternity brothers who's also, uh, you know, heavily uh, devoted, uh, you know, Christian in the church. I called him, we prayed, and he said, you know, he said, Brother Robinson, I have to be honest with you. People can Google you. They can type in Sean Anthony Robinson and see all the stories about you. But what they can't Google is the knowledge you have about the principles of reading and how you teach reading. So you can't be fearful anymore. You got to go out there and you got to open your gifts to the world and allow people uh, inside of not only how you learn to read, but how you teach reading now, because people can't Google that. Like people, they, they can't Google that. And so when I gave my keynote, I did, and then I did a breakout session. My breakout session was going to, was going to be on black boys and dyslexia, but the Holy spirit convicted me to, to flip it and do a, a, a lesson on spelling. Like I did for that Instagram one, but mm-hmm. I did a full, I did a full uh, 90 minute one. And when I got done, I had uh, 30 teachers that wanted to sign up to take a, a workshop with me. Well, I wanted to take the class, but then it's only for what? I think residents of that state. Nah, so I, I flipped the script here. Uh, I'm probably in trouble for saying this, but that's okay. I'm not worried about it. I'm actually offering a eight uh, session workshop. That's going to be three hours each workshop. So it's 24 hours total. 
to gain the knowledge that I've learned over the course of my life and teaching Dr. Nash's principles to teachers, tutors, parents. For $600, you get, you get me and, and my experiences for eight, eight sessions for three hours each session. So that's like 25 bucks, really, you know, it comes down to it. It's, it's nothing, you know, because most training programs, what are thousands of dollars. dollars. So for me, for a 20, over a 24 hour period, it's just $600. And um, I'm capping it at 15 people because I believe in small learning environments. I believe in small, intimate discussions about what I do. And I'm very intentional not to make it public because I don't need any demonic spirits or crazy cult people coming in telling me I don't know what I'm talking about. I don't have time for that. I don't need, I don't need people's approval anymore. This is God's work. I'm doing service. If you got a, a problem, get to the back of the line and you can stay there. Like I'm not, I'm not trying to in, engage in conversations with you. Like I'm done. So um, it took me years to get here to this space where I felt comfortable enough to open up about Doc's program. And feel comfortable enough to teach it. And so I teach at the community college. I was intentional to make it free for residents of the state of Wisconsin. Tell me, um, that. Tell me the school. Say the school name for us. Uh, uh, Madison College. Okay. And um, I think there's a cost for people that live out of state, but it's not much. because You know, community colleges don't, they're not, you know, they're not expensive in terms of tuition. And I don't know the price of that. But when I first started, I, I was intentional about making this course free because... I wanted to level the playing field, access. Uh, my big thing is access, access, access. How can I get this knowledge to people who need it, right? Like you said, Winifred, before, if you are a parent or if you are an adult and you want to get private tutoring, you come out of pocket. You come out of pocket a lot of money. Yep. And so I was like, you know what? I, I, ethically, I'm not going to do that at, at the community college. So I just say, hey, I want my class for free. And next thing you know, the administration said, okay. And so now in the spring semester, my class is free again. So, um, you know, my thing is just about accessibility. I want to make sure that um, uh, people have this knowledge. And that's why I'm offering this workshop. It's going to be starting in January. It's going to go two months. It's going to meet every Sunday uh, through January and February. And uh, people that take it will walk out with tools to implement immediately. Like it's not something you have to wait three, two years to do or you know, no, no. Uh, as you go through this workshop every week before you come to the next session, you will implement these strategies with either your student or your child. And then we come back the next week, you'll learn more strategies, but you'll get to talk about how these strategies benefited you and you get to reflect on them. So it's, it's not just me talking about theory and talking and saying, you know, Winifred, this is the right way. No, it's, it's Winifred. These are the principles that got me liberated. Like I'm not just selling wolf tickets, right? I'm talking about street credit. Like I'm talking about real application that you could do immediately to help a student encode and decode a word. Now, let me uh, share this real quick. If you can encode, you know, encode is spelling, right? If you can encode a word, you could do what? What can you do when you can spell a word? What can we do as humans, as students, or learners? What can we do when, when we spell a word? Say it, <laughs> say it, read it and write it. Right. We can pronounce right. it. Right. Because we know how to spell it by its sequential order from left to right. Sound structure. Right. We understand the syllables. We understand the syllable stress. We understand, you know, the spelling patterns. We can spell it. We can write it. We can read it and we can pronounce it. Now, reading it does not guarantee you can do what? Spell it. Write it. Mm -hmm. Say it. Spell it. So. My course is all designed for spelling principles, encoding. By the time the student's done with my course at 10, 16 week course, I don't have to worry about the reading because they have become independent in linguistics, understanding the sound structure of our language. And so then when they start looking at words and sentences, then they can start decoding them because they've seen patterns. They've seen root words. They've seen prefixes. They've seen stuff. They can then crack the code. But then the reading doesn't stop there. Like, it doesn't just stop, right? Then they have to think about then reading strategies, right? SQ3R, right? Note-taking, passive reading versus active reading. Just, they have to think about ways and then strategies of how we grasp knowledge, right? How do we comprehend knowledge? 
Like that's a whole different course, right? But if a student has dyslexia and they're not fluent and they are unable to encode or decode words, well, we know that influences comprehension, right? It just, it, it just, it is what it is. But that's why in my course and this training I'm giving, it's all going to focus on spelling. That's it. Rules of spelling, understanding that specific sounds, right? So if we think about the sound er, right? Letters E-R, the sound er, right? There are 14 different ways that we can assign spell the sound er. You have person, you have shirt, you have purchase, you have actor, you have particular, you have earth, you have syrup, you have hour, you have courage, you have soldier, you have chauffeur, colonel, right? It's, it's, so you hear the earth. So those spelling patterns are all assigned to the er, er. So when we spell the sound er, we associate that with different spellings. So when students understand that, they become empowered. They understand the sound, the true richness of our language. Now, people want to argue with me. I don't really get into it. You know, email Webster's Dictionary, argue with them. Because all the knowledge that we need that my professor gave me is right in the dictionary. It's all in the dictionary. Yeah. But empirical wow. research supports this work from Marianne Wolf, from Reed Lyon to Louisa Motes, right? All this work is supported, but I'm just a Negro that know nothing. Like, I don't know anything. You know, I'm just a, you know, nobody, right? I mean, that's how people, <laughs> see, that's how people see it, right? Because I, I don't come from a, a, a white uh, elite thinking background, right? I'm not, I'm not in that circle. And I don't want to be in that circle. I'm, I'm okay being who Sean is. I'm okay with, with the knowledge I know and how I can spread it. I don't need permission anymore. I'm done. But yeah. it, it took, it took me a while to get here. It was almost like a healing process for me and a breakthrough. And uh, I give, you know, glory to God and my family, my wife, you know, just about to change the game. You know, I don't need people's permission anymore. Like you think about the uh sound, right? Uh, right. The schwa sound. There are 20 different combinations to spell the sound uh again students are not going to know every 28 ways to spell it let me just interject here but how do you teach adults because i'm listening to you and i'm like i didn't even hear that in some of the words that you were saying and i'm like i can't spell i don't say that i did a dyslexia uh simulation one time you know remember the the community had that out and they were doing a dyslexia simulation and when i tell you i was one of those kids that shut down Yep. I shut down. I start doing my grocery list. I start picking with other people. You, you really doing this? Cause I, <laughs> I could not continue and I'm listening to you and um, I get a lot of inquiries from adults, right? So how does this work when you're working with an adult who doesn't know, or maybe created these crazy strategies, like certain words, I have to come up with a, like tomorrow, right? The word tomorrow, Tom or Roe. Every time I spell tomorrow, Tom or Ro, that's just it. Certain words, I have to come up with. I, some. Yeah, I can only spell conference by saying conference. Yeah, like, <laughs> okay. So how do you help adults? Because, right, I couldn't even ask a question. I was listening to what you were saying and I was like, I hear the er in there. I don't hear that. And I'm, I'm you know, I'm really like. So how do you, how does it work when you're helping adults who may be in their forties, right? Who want to take this class and they're afraid? Well, first of all, again, language has power, right? So first of all, we got to break that spirit of, I can't. So as of today, Winifred, there's no more, I can't. If I hear, I can't, you owe me a dollar every time you say it. So that's the first thing, right? Language has power, right? So boom, that's out, out, out your vocabulary, right? Boom, that's done. Say it again. I'm getting off this uh, off this webinar. I'm done. I'm going <laughs> to hang up the podcast. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that I have a format that Dr. Nash that we, I use with uh, with students, and we have a workbook, and I teach them how to use the textbook with the dictionary using this format. And so once they are able to understand how to use the dictionary and the workbook and the format, three things happen. Three things I guarantee them in all my classes, three things, that's it. They become confident, they become independent and understanding 
how to spell words by sounds and they become empowered, right? So think about the word tomorrow, right? We we'll use that word. So uh, you, you think about, if we looked up in, in the dictionary, we went to Webster's Collegiate Dictionary, we have tomorrow, tomorrow. Some people might, might say tomorrow, right? Again, it's linguistics as um, Dr. Julie Washington said, right? It's all about culturally, you know, context of where we're at, which means Boston, the South, right? It's all about linguistics and culture and our upbringing, right? But if we're looking at richness of our language and we use the dictionary, that's what I teach, the dictionary and Dr. Nash's system. If we look at the dictionary, it says tomorrow. So if, if we match the letters with sounds, you have t, a, uh, the O makes the a uh sound, right? The first, first syllable, then you have mar, and then you have O, right? So the OR make the R sound, to mar R, right? And then the OW make the long O sound, tomorrow. So I teach students how to connect phonemes, sounds with letters, right? OR, R, it makes the R sound. And then you have the OW, long O, right? O. So students just become self aware and they just start doing this stuff on their own. They just become like the third most common way to spell the sound O. There's two ways before it then. You have the long O, O by itself. You have the OA as in toad, right? Then you have the OW as in snow or tomorrow, right? So the OW makes one sound. So you have two letters that make one sound. They like to use the word digraph, right? Same thing, two make one sound. So I teach these things to students. And after the course of the, the, the semester, they become liberated. I read their, um, what, what is it? Reviews. I read it. You, you posted it, I think, online. And I read the reviews. I was like, yeah. oh, wow. Like, I could potentially learn how to spell. <laughs> <laughs> Look, spelling doesn't happen overnight. Right? right. We know it's research. It takes time. Right. But if you give students intentional instruction that is explicit, systematic, sequential and direct and you give it to them with intensive instruction, they're going to catch on. Right. I still struggle with spelling. I'm 43 and I'm OK with that. But I know how to use the dictionary and I know how to sound things out. I don't have to rely on uh, word, you know, like sometimes, you know, word does, does checks for you. But sometimes I'll have to go back to the dictionary to make sure I'm spelling it right. And I'm okay with that. Like, look, I'm, I'm not, the, you know, perfect. And I tell students, I don't look for perfection. I look for progress. Mm -hmm. None of my students that I've taken my class that finished it have been at the level they started at. None of them. None of them. They've all have made, in their eyes, significant gains. I'll give you an example. I had a, a adult 43 that was reading at an elementary level. When she got done with my class, the highlight of her 16-week experience was not only did she feel more confident about spelling, but she was able to read street signs. Mm. There's power in that. There's power in somebody being able to read street signs, a newspaper, a menu, grocery store, you know, items, right? Uh, recipes, right? There's power in that. So the research world would say, you know, that's not really significant, you know, but they're, they're not in the worlds that we live in, right? right? You tell a grown adult that feels confident that they can read street signs, that's not significant. You get slapped in the face, right? right. I mean, right. it's empowerment. And so all the students that come to my class, when they're done, they're way better than when they started. I don't just, you know, sell them wolf tickets. I, I don't, I'm very humble about my experiences. I, I don't know everything. I don't, I tell them, hey, I don't know everything. And if I don't know it, I will find out and I'll get back to you within 48 hours, you know, 24 hours. I'm okay with that because we're all on this le journey learning together, right? So Sean, can I ask just, um, so I understand that the uh, the college, you have this, this course for adults and now you are getting ready to release what I'm assuming is an online course, this, this eight-part online course. It's more, uh, it's like, of course, but I'm, I'm framing it more like a, a workshop and training, you know, but yes, it's, <laughs> it's Look at it as a course, but it's going to be, uh, you know, um, kind of high intensive workshop. And if someone's interested, how would they how would they sign up? Um, they can email me and I can send them the uh, the link, but I'm not putting out there in the airwaves right now because, again, 
I'm not trying to get all these loony boo, you know, in my course, man. I'm not, I don't have time for that, man. I don't have time for, you know, these coats and people coming at me and say, Hey, you know what you're doing? No, I don't have time for, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't want to allow that energy in my life. You know, I need to stay focused. I need to stay in my lane and I don't need to be trying to jump in somebody else's lane or have some jump. No, I'm, I'm good. So if they're interested, I'll send the link, the workshop will close on uh, December 10th. And uh, if people are serious, they got to, you know, make the uh, registration payment by uh, the end of uh, November. They get one of Dr. Nash's books and I'm going to teach them how to use the book. And then they can then uh, be able to teach either their students in their class or teach themselves or teach their child. Right. Yeah, I definitely see because that one is January and February and the max is 15 students. So or 15, uh, 15, you know, participants, 15 participants. Yeah, and then. Yeah. I mean, what, March, April, I'm thinking like, when's the next one? <laughs> like uh, May, June, like it's got to be a next one. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm going to take it as it is. I'm going to see how this one goes, right? And see what type of uh, demand there is, if there's any, right? And then I, I'll get you from there, you know? I definitely know there's demand because the parents I work with are looking for training. They want to learn how to help their kiddos at home. And, and we've been trying to get funding to support parent training. So I definitely feel like there's a need because, you know, I've been working on my end over here in, in Baltimore and in Maryland, trying to get funding to help train parents. Yeah. Specifically, I know parents want to be able to help their child at home who can't afford the 70 to $95 per session at three sessions a week, three to five sessions a week. Right. And $600 is a steal. Yeah, you know, see the thing, there's a lot of programs out there, right? I will never knock another program. Like that's not that's not who I am. That's not my lane, right? I'm not I'm not go out here and, and and try to you know speak down about somebody or somebody's lane like a lot of people do. The principles that Doc taught me are ones that you will find to be able to implement immediately. Mm. Immediately, like you'll be able to do this stuff independently. Again, three things: confidence, independent and empowerment. And that's what I teach my students. And now we're in week nine of the semester. And if some of these students wanted to drop the course at the mid mark because it's a 16 week course, there are a good handful of students that have already mastered this content and they can, they can move on. They don't need my class anymore. Like they're, they are free to go. So they have become consumers of this and the, the college is actually making another re recruitment video and they're using the testimony of four current students in my class for recruitment purposes for the springtime and they're going to talk about their experiences in the class and how it's changed their their life and inspired them to enjoy vocabulary or reading or spelling so um you know again i don't know everything i know a few things what i know works Sean, can I, can I can I pull it back to the personal? Uh, and I'm I'm keeping an eye on the clock, and so we 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 only have a, yeah, a every few minute minutes. every minute I go over, man, that's going to be a charge <laughs> on Winifred's uh, clock, man. But um, you know, I don't know if our uh, if you follow if you follow Sean online, you'll see that he's uh, a devoted ed educator. That brother spends a lot of time, a lot of miles on a bike, you know, staying fit. But that you're also very centered in being a father and a husband. And I don't know if our editor is going to be able to cut out, but I can I can hear your boys playing in the background. I'm just oh. curious, like what, what's been the experience for you, given the, the fight that you had to go through school to get to the point where, you know, you got your Ph.D. How was it, you know, working with your sons and seeing them as they are in these first few years of acquiring language and, and navigating through the school system. What's that, what's that experience like for you as a, as a parent and a, and a husband? Yeah, it's been pretty cool. You know, somebody asked me that at my, uh, at my breakout session in Iowa. And I told them before my, my oldest son was even born, um, I took Dr. Nash's system, his language, his sounds, and I read them to my wife's you know, belly when he was still in there. And then when he, when he came out, he did the same thing. You know, I made sure that he understood the sound structure of our language, the pureness, the richness of our language. And so, um, you know, he, he's, he's an excellent speller. You know, uh, as for a second grader, you know, he gets usually 100 percent, you know, 95 percent on the spelling test. Uh, he got an 87 because he missed the, the Y on greedy. You know, hey, it's 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 I mean, you know, it's not that, you know, but he likes to read, you know, but he, he's seven, you know, and so I'm not, you know, forcing upon him you know like i would be intentional for older adults but i make sure hey we're going to read my wife we're going to read 
we're going to stand these sounds. We're going to stand how to spell, right? Because that's, that's power, right? That's, you know, and I, you know, I've had some, um, we had an experience with a teacher that tried to label him slow, right? In first grade. And my, my wife and I, uh, you know, tag team on that teacher, you know, didn't make her cry when the just so, you know, but, uh, you know, don't, don't play with my kid. Don't play with my son. Don't, don't call him slow. Like, you know, don't, don't try to put him in that box because her definition of slow was because in first grade, he was not able to sew. What first grader sewing? Like needle you know? and thread sew. Yes. Right. So my wife was like, you know, if I brought you to the ER, my wife's a doctor and I asked you to stitch somebody up, could you do it? So are you slow? Like, you know, and I, <laughs> I, like, I mean, right. And I was like, you know, I, I, I study research on white teachers that label black kids slow. You know, I just came out and said it to her, you know, like, hey, no, 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 don't mess with my kid. Don't do that. You know, because if you did it to my kid, how many other kids you do it to, right? Right. So I think right. the message that my wife and I sent was, it's going to stop. And I, I best believe it's probably stopped with other kids who look like my son, you know. But, you know, uh, it, it, it's, uh, it's nothing but joy when I get to see my, my son come home and spell and pass tests both of them are successful at the alphabet and you know reading you know my four-year-old you know reads words too you know and um spells you know and so um one of my professors who also taught me how to read dr kids he made he made a joke last year and my son was in first grade he said your son has spelled and got more hundreds on spell tests than you ever did in your life and i said yeah that's right he did and, and, I, and I, I'm, I'm okay with that. You know, I, I'm okay with, you know, uh, having him do that. You know, I have no shame in it, you know? Uh, so um, it's just really rewarding, man, to be able to be a, a, you know, father and a husband. And, you know, I tell people first, you know, before my scholarly work or, you know, stuff I do, I'm, I'm a father first, you know, I, that's who I am. You know, it's not the researcher. It's not Dr. Dyslexia dude, you know, I'm blessed, uh, highly favored, you know, to have a, a family, a beautiful wife, strong wife who deals with me, you know, because I'm a lot to deal with. I'm days. It is. It, it, oh, we man. we've experienced um, Dr. Robinson. She is no joke. You know, okay, so, I know that. You know, so I'm just, I'm just, I'm just very blessed. You know, uh, I'm very fortunate to have a beautiful family. So yeah, my kids, they they love school. You know, and Sean, just as we close out, can you give our our audience, you know, that maybe one piece of advice? What's the one piece of advice that you would have for? for families who are, who are listening to this, this episode. For any parent out there, you know, you just got to keep moving. You can't take no for an answer. You got to keep fighting. That like little train, choo, choo, you just got to keep moving. You know, like Muhammad, you got to bob and weave, you know, you know, you can't throw in the towel. Tune in next week where we'll continue to bring you lived experiences and more unfiltered conversations with experts in the field around all things Black and dyslexic. Make sure you subscribe and follow the Black and Dyslexic podcast, where we educate, empower, and equip Black and underrepresented minorities. The Black and Dyslexic podcast is partially funded by Morgan Cares and the Center for Urban Health Disparities Research and Innovation, awarded by the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities. The Black and Dyslexic podcast is sponsored by Dyslexia Advocation Incorporated, a 501c3 charitable organization located in Baltimore City, Maryland, whose mission is to equip parents of children with dyslexia and other language-based learning disabilities with the necessary tools to help their children become successful readers. You can find them on the web at www.soallcanread.org.